Okay, so our next speakers uh, are connected online, as you can see. So, um, and are Andrea Iacono and Samuel Iacquinto, both from the University of Turin. And they're gonna talk about uh, post-semantic Persianism. So I give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Giuliano. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, so uh, today, Andrea and I would like to argue that uh, there is a version of Persianism, the view that all future contingents are false, that is able to overcome three major problems that have been traditionally uh, raised in connection with Persianism. And these three problems uh, basically are uh, the apparent scopelessness of will with respect to negation, the failure of the principle of future excluded middle, and what is sometimes labeled in the literature as the zero credence problem. Let us stress from the very beginning that here we are not going to argue in favor of the idea that all future contingents are false. Uh, we all know that uh, Persianism is a notoriously controversial uh, view, and several authors, including ourselves, to be honest, uh, doubt its ultimate tenability. Rather, what we would like to argue for today is a conditional claim. If you think that all future contingents are false, then you would be better adopting our view because it is comparatively better than uh, the standard version of Persianism because it solves the three aforementioned problem, problems. Okay, let us start by considering the uh, canonical version of Persianism, which we are going to label today semantic Persianism, uh, which was uh, originally presented by Pryor in his seminal book, uh, uh, Past, Present, and Future. Here is a quotation from Pryor. In describing the gist of the view, he says, it will be that P is not true until it is in some sense settled that it will be the case. And it will be that not P is not true until it is in some sense settled that not P will be the case. If the matter is not thus settled, both these assertions are simply false. So suppose, um, for, for example, that you have to evaluate uh, Sentence number one, it will rain tomorrow, and since sentence number two, it will not rain tomorrow. Well, according to Persianism, both the sentences are false for the simple reasons that uh, there are possible futures in which it will rain tomorrow and possible futures in which it will not rain tomorrow. And very similar considerations obviously apply to uh, any other sentence about the future that does not express the determinate truth because what is expressed by the sentence is true in some possible futures but false in other possible futures. It is possible to uh, offer a rigorous uh, um, description of uh, semantic Persianism in the framework of branching time semantics. Uh, this is basically done by offering a quantificational analysis of will. Uh, suppose that you have a very simple language L containing, as is customary, uh, a vocabulary constituted by a set of sentence letters P, Q, R, etc., two uh, propositional connectives, negation and disjunction, and the metric tense operator Fn. It will be the case that in n units of time. Um, it is important to stress that here we will limit our attention to the metric uh, tense operator while setting aside um, any consideration about uh, its non-metric counterpart for reasons that here we can safely ignore. Uh, we can come back to this point uh, during the Q&A, if you like. Well, um, now one may define a branching time model in the usual way as a triple whose first member, capital M, is an empty set of moments, the second member is a strict partial order on the non-empty set of moments. And the third and last member is a valuation function assigning value zero or one to every atomic formula of our language for each moment history pair MH, where uh, H is defined as a maximal linearly ordered set of moments pass passing through M. Okay. 
Now, what about the truth conditions of a formula containing the metric tense operator Fn? What we need in order to deliver a semantic uh, uh, Persianism, version of semantic Persianism, uh, as I anticipated, uh, is um, a quantificational analysis of will. This can be done by adopting definition one here. The clause says that the formula Fn alpha is true at a moment history pair mh if and only if alpha holds n units of time after m in each history h prime uh, passing through, through m, which is the upper bound of our trunk, as it were. It is important to stress that this definition, which is, as I repeat, a quantificational analysis of will, crucially differs from definition number two, where one can find an, a linear rather than quantificational analysis of will. Why this analysis is linear? Well, uh, because um, the condition of alpha holding n units after the moment m only concerns, as you can see, a single history, namely h itself. We will come back to this definition because uh, it is going to play a crucial role in uh, uh, delivering our version of Persianism. But for the time being, let us focus on the problems afflicting the standard version of Persianism. Let us start from the problem of the scopelessness of will with respect to negation. Consider once again sentence number two, it will not rain tomorrow. And sentence number three, it is not the case that it will rain tomorrow. Now, uh, there is uh, sensibly no difference in terms of truth conditions between uh, sentence number two and, sense, and sentence number uh, three, intuitively speaking. And more generally, one can, can argue that there is apparently no difference in truth conditions between natural language sentences that are form, formalized respectively by using this formula here, Fn not alpha, and this formula here, it is not the case that Fn alpha. This seems to offer, uh, one might argue, some linguistic evidence in favor of the equivalence between these two um, formulae here. In Cagliani and Santorio's words, it seems that will is scopeless with respect to negation. Where's the problem for Persianism? Well, uh, the problem is if one is going to adopt a quantificational analysis of will, that is definition one of the handout, then one ends up having uh, two very different truth conditions associated to the two formulas. Uh, regardless of the formal details, basically, what the first uh, clause says is that uh, a formula like Fn not alpha as value one, if and only if for each branch uh, passing through a given moment m at a certain distance from m, the formula alpha as value zero. While the second one um, requires the existence of at least one branch where uh, the formula alpha has value zero at a certain distance of, uh, from, uh, from the upper bound of, uh, of the trunk, as it were. So very different truth conditions. Uh, we are not arguing that this is a knockdown argument against the Persianism, of course, but uh, once again, our dialectic here is simply that uh, it would be highly desirable to have a version of personism able to vindicate the claim that all future contingents are false, while um, giving um, justice to the linguistic evidence that uh, two and three, sentence two and three, does not differ in, um, in terms of truth conditions. The second problem is strictly related to the first one, and it is the failure of future excluded middle. Consider sentence number um, five, uh, sorry, four, either it will rain tomorrow or it will not rain tomorrow, um, which is an instantiation of the principle of future excluded middle. Now, intuitively speaking, this is a valid uh, sentence. Uh, this express a valid principle. In Thomas and words, it will or it won't has the force of tautology. It is invariably true to say things such as either it will rain tomorrow or it won't. 
the Persian um, theories here as a problem because um, as far as both the disjuncts of future excluded middle represent future contingents, uh, the disjunction itself uh, is false uh, as well. Once again, this is not a knockdown argument against Persianism, but still it would be highly desirable to have a theory able to vindicate the intuitive validity of the principle of future excluded middle. Why this problem is a consequence of the first one? Well, because as we know, person semantics validates excluded middle uh, without validating the future excluded middle principle precisely because within this framework, uh, this formula here is not derivable from this formula here and vice versa. Okay, uh, this concludes the discussion of the first two problems. What about the third one, the so-called zero credence problem? Okay, let us consider the following toy example. Suppose that uh, we have an agent who is going to throw a coin while knowing that the coin is fair. Now, the question we would like to ask is the following. What is the degree of credence that the agent should assign to a sentence like five, this coin will lend tails? Now, it's quite uh, natural, uh, quite intuitive to expect that um, a rational agent uh, obeys some principle able to relate her credences with beliefs about objective chances. And the principle of this kind can be found here, Lewis's principle principle. Here you can find a rigorous definition of the principle, but once again, uh, let us focus on the intuitive picture. Uh, intuitively, what the principle says is that the credibility at a given moment M of uh, the sentence, this coin will lend tails, conditional on the proposition that the objective chance of tails is 0 0.5 equals 0 0.5. Where's the problem for the person? Well, once again, this conclusion seems at odd with the idea that all future contingents are false on the assumption that one or to ascribe zero credence uh, to the sentences that one evaluates as false, uh, the agent should ascribe zero credence uh, to sentence number five, contrary to what is prescribed by Lewis's principal principle. Okay, uh, this concludes uh, our presentation of the three problems for semantic personism. Now we are going to present our view uh, which we are going to label post-semantic personism for reasons that will be uh, clear in a while. Okay, in order to <clears throat> propose uh, our version of personism, it is important to appreciate uh, a distinction that has been employed by several authors in the recent debate about future contingents. I'm referring to the distinction between semantics proper and uh, post-semantics. So there are two questions that one might want to ask. One is about how a technical notion of truth can be defined to convey an adequate formal analysis of will. The second question uh, instead concerns how our pre-theoretical understanding of truth can be explained in, term, in terms of such a notion. And in order to illustrate this distinction, um, let us assume that one is willing to adopt definition number two of the handout, which is the linear analysis of will described at the outset of the talk. Okay, now given these uh, analyses at the level of semantic propers, there are at least two different ways in which one can deliver a uh, post um, semantics, that is, in which one can uh, explain our pre-theoretical understanding of truth in terms of the defined notion of truth at a moment history pair. One possible solution is going for supervaluationism, which is the view uh, that identifies uh, clause A, truth simpliciter with truth in all possible futures, and clause B, falsity simpliciter with falsity in all possible futures. When a sentence is neither true nor possible futures, nor false in all possible futures, we say, uh, close C, that A is neither true nor false. So uh, supervaluationism allows for truth value gaps, and this is one of uh, the most notable um, features of the view. We will return on this point in a while. 
Um, the other possible um, version of post semantics uh, is uh, what we would like to label in this context uh, Occamism. Occamism uh, um, identifies truth simpliciter with truth in the actual history, as says um, by clause A and uh, clause B, uh, falsity simpliciter with falsity in the actual history. Okay. So it seems that supervaluationism and Occamism are two ways uh, um, in which uh, one can uh, explain uh, truth simpliciter um, while keeping at the level of semantic, uh, semantics proper the very same notion of truth for the moment history pair. In the first case, uh, the supervaluationist one, one ends up having a quantificational post-semantics based on a linear semantics. In the second case, the Occamist one, um, the one that we call here Occamist at least, uh, one ends up having a linear post-semantics based on a linear semantics. Okay, once this distinction between uh, uh, semantics proper and post-semantics uh, is appreciated, uh, should be clear that there are at least two different ways in which one can phrase uh, Persianism, the idea that all future contingents are false. One is the usual one, um, semantic Persianism, the view that goes back to the work of prior, and that it is encoded in definition one, that is in a quantificational analysis of will. The second one, which is the one we would like to uh, present today, is post-semantic Persianism. The first clause says that uh, a formula alpha is true at a moment m, if and only if the formula has value one relative to the moment uh, history pair mh for every history passing through m. And uh, um, the formula alpha is false at m otherwise. Now, notice that this definition differs both from uh, supervaluationism and from Occamism for different reasons, of course. It differs from uh, the first one, supervaluationism, in that it does allow truth uh, value, it does not allow truth value gaps. As you can see, every sentence turns out to be true or false, just as in the Occamist framework. But it differs also from the Occamist uh, version of post semantics in that it is quantification at the end of the day rather than linear. Um, as you can see from the handout, uh, clause A in post semantic Persianism is basically the same as clause A in supervaluationism. And this is also the reason why we take this version of Persianism to be a genuine version of Persianism. Uh, this is why we think that uh, the view is able to vindicate uh, the idea that all future contingents are false. Uh, the clause A of post-semantic Persianism is not satisfied whenever uh, the formula alpha is a future contingent. Okay, um, this concludes our presentation of uh, post-semantic Persianism. Now we are going to argue that uh, the view offers uh, very simple solutions to the three aforem uh, aforementioned problems. Let's start by considering once again, the problem of the scopelessness of will with respect to negation. Well, it is quite easy to see that by post-semantic Persianism, uh, F and not alpha, and it is not the case that F and alpha are true, uh, at the given moment M at the very same conditions. In other words, if and only if uh, for every history passing through M, the moment M prime that lies at N units uh, after M along the history H is such that uh, alpha is value zero relative to M prime and the history H. And this concludes <laughs> the, the proof of the first point. Well, uh, analogously, it is easy to see that uh, uh, the principle of future to the middle is vindicated. By post-semantic Persianism, it follows that uh, the principle is true at every moment. Uh, here's the very simple uh, proof of this. Take an arbitrary moment M for any history passing through M. Definition two, that is the linear analysis of will, entails either that the formula F and alpha is value one, 
or that Fn not alpha is value one relative to mh for every, for either, sorry, alpha holds at n units after m or it doesn't. It follows that the, the disjunction obtained by combining the two uh, formulas uh, as value one, therefore, the future excluded middle is true at the moment uh, m. Um, the discussion of the zero credence problem is a little bit more complicated, but before presenting it, uh, let me stress uh, an interesting analogy uh, um, between uh, post semantic Persianism and supervaluationism in discussing the failure um, of future excluded middle. Let's say that post semantic Persianism is pretty analogous in this respect to supervaluationism. Um, in vindicating the future x through the middle, I mean, for it treats future x through the middle as a disjunction whose value does not depend truth functionally on uh, the value of its disjuncts. Both the disjuncts can be false, and nonetheless, uh, the disjunction can be true. We think this is a positive uh, result for anyone who is willing to, uh, to think that the intuitive plausibility of future excluded middle is worth the price of truth functionality. It is important to stress, however, that um, uh, we are not uh, claiming that post-semantic Persianism is better uh, than uh, uh, supervaluationism. Um, arguably, it shares with supervaluationism some problems which have, have been widely discussed in the recent literature, for instance, uh, failure of truth functionality, problems uh, concerning retrospective assessments, knowledge ascriptions, uh, and there is no reason in principle to expect that it fares better uh, than uh, supervaluationism with respect to those problems. Once again, our point is simply that uh, uh, post-semantic Persianism is comparatively better than semantic Persianism in that it is able to overcome these problems here the problems that uh, we are discussing in this uh, last uh, uh, section. Okay, in order to describe our solution to the last problem, let us rephrase a little bit uh, the problem in these terms. Let us start from the intuitive picture. Well, the problem in, in the context of the zero credence problem is that there is a certain conflict with the, between uh, uh, two different uh, principles. On the one hand, we have the principal principle, uh, which requires our credences to be somehow related with beliefs about objective chance. On the other hand, uh, there is a principle that requires one to ascribe zero credence uh, to all the sentences that one is willing to evaluate um, as false. So uh, in order to see how our solution works, we would like to borrow some terminology from uh, Cariani 2021, um, who defines the world profile of a sentence A in context C, you can see the definition here in the handout, as the set of worlds that are open possibility in that context and where A is true. Translating in our terminology, the world profile of A at the moment M is the set of histories in which A is true at that moment. Then he goes on in uh, defining the principle called emptiness. I'm quoting Cariani here. He says, emptiness is the principle according to which if a, if a sentence A is uttered in context C has an empty word profile, then it is rationally permissible to ascribe to its content a very low credence, zero or near zero. So the line of thought uh, seems to be something like that. The world profile of a sentence like the coin will lend tails must be empty if uh, personism is true for uh, the sentence this coin will lend tails uh, turns out to be false at every world. Therefore, if you accept emptiness, uh, it is rationally permissible to assign zero to the sentence that the coin will lend tails. Um, to summarize, if you accept emptiness, uh, and you should because it it is a plausible, a very plausible assumption, and you also endorse personism, well, you end up with a view that conflicts with uh, the principal principle, which is a quite uh, um, plausible principle as well. Okay, Cariani's point is well taken, of course, 
if definition one, that is the quantification of analysis is, uh, of will is adopted. In other words, uh, uh, the point uh, of Cariani is uh, perfectly fine as far as one is considering just the uh, version of personism that we label semantic uh, personism. For, for any uh, moment M and history H, a formula like uh, Fn alpha is false at uh, M and, and in the history H whenever alpha is false after N units along some history uh, that goes uh, uh, through M. And so its work profile is empty. It is interesting to note, however, that if one is willing to adopt definition two, that is the linear analysis of will, it turns out that uh, the formula is true at the moment M in some histories and false at M in other histories. Uh, this means that its work profile is not, is not empty after all. Uh, this provides some evidence that uh, post-semantic uh, personism can consistently hold both emptiness and the principal principle. And this concludes our defense of uh, post-semantic personism. These are the reasons why we think it is comparatively better than uh, its uh, semantic counterpart. Thank you. Okay. You okay. haven't heard, but has been an applause. Anyway, okay, uh, okay. let's begin with uh, Oliver. Hi, Sam Reilly. Um, Hi, thank you. Uh, so I've got to worry about the, um, the uh, well, I, I think there's a way in which the semantic person might look better um, because it's truth functional. So, mm -hmm. Um, you have future excluded middle coming out as true, even though both disjuncts are false. Mm -hmm. that, that might be great, and it's a bit like supervaluationism, which has gappy disjuncts and a true disjunction. But it's, I, th I think I'm right in saying that you will have future A coming out as false if there's some histories where A is true and some histories where A is not true, but also not future A. Uh, coming out. So you've got a sentence and, a sentence and its negation both being false. So n negation is not truth functional in a way that looks problematic. Whereas, of course, for semantic Persianism, you don't have that. Okay. Um, Andrea, let me know if you, if you want to answer the question. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's okay, I can, is, I can is that a problem? Is the question okay? Okay, okay. Well, okay. Um, well, thank you, thank you for, uh, for the question. I mean, um, uh, if I understand you right, I would say that, uh, um, I, I agree your concern with respect to the behavior of negation. Um, this is one of the reasons why maybe uh, this version of personism uh, is not is not one of the best competitors on the market when it comes to a comparison with uh, other versions of uh, post semantics uh, treatment of future contingents like supervaluationism uh, for instance and what we labeled occamism but once again i mean uh, i think that it might be enough to say that uh, uh, this version of uh, personism is comparatively better than uh, the traditional one um, in that it solves uh, the, the three problems presented. I don't know whether I answered the, the question. Yeah. Can I, can I add something? Sure. Uh, yeah. Of course, what you get in the post semantic variants or, or personage is that uh, you have non truth functionality of the disjunction, which is something that uh, you don't get. But the, the problem of negation is something that you already have uh, in traditional personages because uh, you have to say that both uh, future contingents are false, right? You have to say that um, uh, future P and its negation are both false because 
they are true only in some histories. Would, would you agree on that? that so I, I, mean, I, I was thinking it's, so you have future not P as false on semantic Persian, but not future P is true. Oh, okay, okay, so, so you're saying uh, with the traditional version, you can have uh, two distinct uh, um, formulas with distinct truth conditions, and you can say that the one in which the uh, negation has is uh, external, right? Uh, it's different. Is, is that what you were suggesting? Yeah, so so I semantic Persian semantic Persianism Persianism doesn't respect the uh, scopelessness, but that might seem like a good thing here. Um, and you know, there are some fun things about neg raising that Patrick Todd's talked about defending the mm -hmm. you know, arguing back against scopelessness. Um Okay. Okay. So you, you can. Uh, I mean, I, I I see I see your point. You can you can phrase it uh, as a dilemma for the Persian, right? We, we're presenting like a different horn of the dilemma. I, either you take the, uh, the 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 problem about. Uh, I mean, you argue against the objection about the scopelessness, apparent scopelessness of of will with respect to negation, or you get. I mean, what you what what we are suggesting, but it, it, I mean, in any case, you have one of the two. Of course, if you think that the problem of scopelessness can be overcome, then maybe you prefer that option rather than post semantic uh, the post semantic version. But we were assuming that that is a problem. We were assuming that um, you should. Uh, preserve the apparent scopelessness of, of with, with respect to negation. Okay, you want to say something? Okay, okay. Graham. Hello. Um, nice to see you remotely. Sorry, not to see you in person. Um, this is Graham, by the way. Um, so. So I'm, I'm wondering what the rules of the game here are. So we've got a semantics that you've presented that has certain consequences and, and there's clearly a sense that some con consequences are more desirable than others, but you know, we, we come up with the semantics to say what we want for a kind of purpose. And as you know, I've, I've got my own going on. Um, kind of how are we supposed to be assessing this? Like what, what are we trying to achieve with the semantics? And, and sort of more generally, like wh what is it about Persianism that is that I'm meant to find compelling, as it were? Because I've 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 already got my kind of supervaluationist sort of horse. I'm um, I'm a big fan of. But um, what about Persianism is is meant to kind of pull me away from that and think, oh, I've been doing my semantics wrong this whole time. Can, can I? Sure. sure. Uh, we, we don't have, we don't really have a, an argument for personalities in that sense. I mean, as far as the, the core idea of, of the view is concerned, namely that, you know, all future contingents are false because, you know, they are true in some future, but not in others. Uh, I mean, we, we do not endorse person per se. And so, we, we were just trying to present what is uh, a good version for someone who accept that uh, idea. Uh, so I, I, I really don't, I mean, we really have no argument to offer to, I mean, for you, if you, if you think that uh, supervaluation is, is, is preferable, we, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to say about that. 
let, let me add that we ourselves are, um, do not follow the, the person strategy in any way. So it's more like a, 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 an attempt to, to get a progress in the discussion and show that at least some of the arguments against uh, persisting should be, uh, you know, uh, adjust depending on the version that you uh, accept and not every argument that has been proposed against it uh, uh, can work uh, against any version of it. So it's more like uh, making a point of that kind rather than uh, trying to, to present a full defense of person because we no, are no. not. So, so I, I see you're not presenting a full defense. Um, I, the, the worry is something like if I don't know what the motivation is, so if I don't like get what intuitions I'm, I'm trying to satisfy with this, I can't tell if, I, I can't tell how I'm supposed to assess whether what you're doing is, is, is useful. So, so it's not that I want you to give like a full knockdown argument, but just a, a sense of what, what intuitions lead this to be a particularly satisfying solution, even though you don't, ultimately endorse it yourself. I mean, th does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I think I, I see your point, but still, even if you just assume that uh, personism is um, the view according to which we should think uh, by faith that all future contingents are false, I think it is quite interesting to, to know that there is a, a version of this view uh, that overcomes uh, um, some problems that the traditional one is unable to, to overcome. And um, I guess that you can, you can see that the, 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 the more complex version is able to overcome these problems, if, even though you, you are not told why you should believe that all future contingents are false. But what makes them problems? Like, so all the views succeed in having all future contingents being false, but you say there are problems, but I don't know why they're problems until you tell me. Okay, okay, well, the, well, yeah, I know. Uh, I, I'm, let's say that uh, they are problems uh, insofar as they contrast very strong intuitions. So for instance, the failure of excluded middle, future excluded middle uh, is, pretty in contrast with the intuition that uh, uh, that principle is a tautology or something like that. I mean, of course you can say that uh, ultimately speaking, this is not a problem. And that's the reason why I, I said that uh, um, the failure of the middle is not a knockdown argument against personism. But still, I think that you can call it a problem insofar as you have the strong intuition. I, I am sure that uh, in things are so that this principle is a tautology, right? And similar considerations apply to what some call linguistic evidence about the scopelessness of will with respect to negation. I mean, once again, yeah, maybe uh, it's not a problem uh, if you are going to, to argue extensively that at the end of the day, we have reason to, to drop uh, uh, the idea that uh, this is a problem, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, uh, we have good evidence, I think, at least prima facie to say that these are problems because they conflict with either linguistic data or with strong intuitions. Okay, thanks. So any other questions, Sven? If you want to be seen, you have to go there. Seen, I don't know. Um, yeah, I know. So uh, I have a question about the, the last objection to semantic personalism. Um, yeah. So I take it that on, on the semantic Persian pers view, will can be read as determinately will. Mm. Right? Uh, right. And then what's really the problem here? Because I mean, if it's a future contingent, then determinately will. What are the chances of that? So it doesn't seem to be a conflict with a principle principle. It's, it seems more like that on that view, because we have to identify will with determinately will, we, we 
Mm. We don't have the expressive resources that we would like to have. Isn't that rather the, the complaint? Because I mean, if, if you read that consistently as it's determined, determined that it will be the case, mm -hmm. uh, then I don't see why the chances should be anything other than zero. Um, the, can I go on and reply? Okay. Yeah, go on. Yeah, this is a quite interesting uh, question. Thank you. Well, I think that there is a certain ambiguity in the literature um, when describing the, uh, the gist of uh, personism, because yeah, on, on the one hand, it seems that uh, uh, the view says that all future contingents are false, see it's implicit, uh, while um, in other formulations, uh, you got the impression that uh, what the person is really doing is simply restricting our expressive resources, uh, as it were, to a fragment of our language. Um, I have to say that uh, if uh, you endorse the second interpretation, then, uh, well, I basically agree with you. But I am quite un unsure that, uh, um, ultimately speaking, the, the view is described uh, in, in the literature as, uh, uh, as a view that restricts our expressive resources. I mean, it's usually interpreted as a view according to which uh, um, personism can and should uh, uh, properly formalize uh, future contingents, uh, and these are, are false. Andrea, you want to add Another anything? Question? I think it's, uh, I'm fine with the, uh, yeah, someone else replied. Sven, a rejoinder or? Do you want a rejoinder or? Yes. I, I'm not quite sure whether I got the response. So, so I mean, all, all, all these objections that you gave at the beginning, if I, if I read will as it determinately will, or it's determined that it will be the case, then I don't see any, any intuition here that we should preserve uh, future excluded middle, that we should uh, have scopelessness. Um, and I don't see any violation of, of the principal principle. So as objections to that reading, I find that not very convincing. What I do find convincing is that we still want to have the expressive resources to say something will happen contingently. Right? And, and that, that's basically what, what we don't get if, if will is uniformly interpreted as it's determined that it will be the case. And that would be a reason to reject uh, personism in the first place, you say? Yes, yes. Can I, can I add something? But uh, I think, Sven, that um, uh, that would be one way of, of showing the uh, counterintuitive consequences of identifying will with determinately will precisely pointing out that uh, it seems, if you don't think about the, the, I mean, an analysis of the meaning of, of will, it seems that you should have uh, scopelessness, it seems that you should have future through the middle. So uh, if you start with the hypothesis that uh, will and determinately we are the same thing, then uh, there is something that you are missing. So uh, probably it's like you say, it's a, it's a a uh, failure of identifying some differences, but uh, the, the problems that uh, have been uh, attributed to, to persons are precisely uh, symptoms of that. Um, yeah, but I think that, 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 that goes back to what, what Graham said before. Uh, it's not clear what the rules of the game are. So if you, if you really want to, so the point I was making has nothing to do with how well that matches ordinary language. I'm just saying I want theoretically to draw distinctions that that view doesn't allow me to draw, right? So mm -hmm. I need another will operator that allows me to do that, okay? Um, so, but that's, these are theoretical reasons. It has nothing to do with how natural it sounds that uh, it has to be true that either it will rain tomorrow or it will not rain tomorrow. Uh, that, that doesn't play a role. 
because as a, as, as a theoretician, let's say, as a metaphysician, if you like, um, I, I perhaps couldn't care less about uh, uh, ordinary language intuition. I just wanted to, to, to be able to, to map the terrain and to say, say all the things I want to say for theoretical reasons. And so that, that's why I think that the motivation would be rather different. Um, yeah. There's a follow-up <clears throat> by Carl. Okay, new question, sir. Hello, guys. Um, this is just a small thing about the principle principle uh, objection, the chance objection. If, um, if one thinks of chances as attaching to types of events, um, then the, there doesn't seem to be any intuitive problem with saying either about a, uh, an event that happened in the past that it, it happened and its chance um, is 50% or was 50%, um, if you want to use the tensed way of talking about it, or that um, the coin will land heads tomorrow and its chance is 50%. Um, so I just wanted to mention that there's, it's not um, for people who work on chance, a lot of people wouldn't be moved by the, uh, the intuition that saying something is false means it has chance zero to begin with. You want to say something? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, any further questions, remarks? Okay, so we are going to thank you with an audible applause this time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your attention and for your questions.